Well, thank you all for listening today. I'm Richard Ayler, Professor of Medicine at the USF Division of Infectious Diseases. And today I'm going to be talking about two important infectious syndromes, leptospirosis and relapsing fever. So um, the spirochetes are a, a very important classification of bacteria and leptospira and Borrelia uh, cause these syndromes respectively. Now, I'm not going to be talking about all of the clinically relevant spirochetes today. Uh, for example, I won't be talking about Brachospira, which is the etiologic agent of intestinal spirochetosis, or the treponemes, which cause syphilis and a variety of other uh, clinical syndromes. Um, a discussion of the treponemes would require an entire hour or more on its own. So as the name suggests, these are spiral or corkscrew shaped bacteria, and uh, they're easily uh, visualized under dark field microscopy and occasionally um, can be visualized in other means. So we're going to start out by discussing a case. And the, uh, the first case involves a 64 year old male who presented to the emergency department at our facility. We actually took care of this individual complaining of a three days history of fever to 101.9 degrees Fahrenheit, along with the other uh, symptoms shown here, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, mild headache, and so forth. Several days earlier, he had returned from an 11 day Caribbean cruise during which he reported travel to several Caribbean destinations like Aruba, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, and Costa Rica. During his trip, he participated in numerous outdoor activities, including river tubing, zip lining, and snorkeling. He says he did not drink uh, non-bottled water and he avoided street food. He denied any known animal exposures. When seen in the emergency department, vital signs revealed a, a fever of 104, tachycardia, and refractory hypotension. And to our physical examination, he had jaundice, scleral icterus, conjunctival suffusion, and subconjunctival hemorrhages. CBC revealed pancytopenia, and his serum chemistries showed elevated liver enzymes with a predominantly direct hyperbilirubinemia. And he had acute kidney injury with uh, a creatinine at 3.7. That was some five times above his baseline, which is about 0 0.8 milligrams per deciliter. He had evidence of uh, multi-organ damage. And uh, however, a coagulopathy workup did not suggest DIC or hemolysis. Thick and thin smears were obtained and no schistocytes or plasmodia were seen. And on CT imaging of the abdomen, he had hepatomegaly, but had no evidence of obstruction. And amylase and lipase levels were normal. So the patient ended up being admitted to the hospital, and empiric vancomycin, zosin, and doxycycline were uh, initially started. And the patient was sent to the ICU with septic shock. Progressively over the next couple of days, he developed uh, patchy bilateral infiltrates respiratory failure, ultimately leading to ARDS and worsening renal failure. But uh, pan cultures were negative. But out of concern for potential exposures during his Caribbean cruise, he was ultimately switched to doxycycline and ceftriaxone and was stabilized after several tenuous days in the ICU. So let's cover the infectious diseases workup. Again, this is a patient returning from the Caribbean. So you think about vector-borne or arthropod-borne causes of fever and a returning traveler. So as we said earlier, thick and thin smears for malaria were uh, negative, no parasites were seen, and the patient had serology and PCR for dengue, chikungunya, and Zika scent, and all of these were negative. And an initial leptospira IgM antibody was also negative, sent to a commercial lab. But although it took several days to come back, a leptospira urine PCR was suspiciously detected. 
And this led us to submit serology to the CDC for an MAT or microscopic agglutination test or mi microscopic antibody test antibody, which was positive. And further return of serology revealed uh, that this was a strain of Leptospira interrogans, Canicola, Canicola rubush, at a titer of 1 to 3200. So the diagnosis was Wiles disease or acute leptospirosis. And upon reflection, uh, it led us to think um, how, what, how was this patient exposed to leptospirosis during his trip? So upon further investigation, the patient admitted that uh, during a stopover at Ocho Rios, Jamaica, a popular Jamaican uh, cruise port located on the uh, northeast corner of the island, he disembarked and signed up for a tubing activity uh, on the White River. He went along with his spouse and uh, uh, went into the, the White River and tubed for an for approximately 45 minutes to an hour or longer. And during that tubing activity, he recalls his head being immersed within the river. His wife who went with him did not recall this uh, immersing activity of his head, of, of her head that is. And as it turns out, the stop at the Jamaican port occurred during rainy season when leptospirosis cases can spike. And this is because increased precipitation can wash effluvians into the river and uh, they, the river can become more contaminated with um, debris and detritus from uh, the areas around the riverbank. And this is an actual photo of the uh, White River and of the tubers on the uh, website which uh, promotes this activity. And uh, Although this gentleman appears to be enjoying himself and he's got a helmet to protect his head, unfortunately, uh, he, he, as shown in this photograph, has very little protection against leptospirosis and is completely unaware of the risk. So let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology of uh, leptospirosis. Uh, this syndrome is caused by uh, pathogenic spirochetes in the genus Leptospira. This is a, a widespread zoonotic infection which uh, tends to favor more uh, temperate and tropical climates. It's not easily diagnosed, um, but even so, uh, there's an estimated 1 million cases globally annually. Leptospira has mammalian hosts, but humans are incidentally infected. Humans are not a a regular mammalian host. Um, so uh, because of the activities and uh, occupational and recreational exposures associated with leptospirosis, there is a distinct male to female predominance, about 80% male and 20% female. Most cases in the US occur in places like the Pacific coastal states and Hawaii. Um, but cases do occur regularly in Florida. And uh, our county, Hillsborough County, Florida, in the Tampa Bay area, in, uh, according to recent uh, health department reporting, uh, uh, does encounter at least one to two cases per year. Um, and this may occur among people kayaking or canoeing in the local rivers or streams um, where uh, contamination of the water can occur. Now, in uh, tropical areas among native-born populations, cases are oftentimes more associated with poor sanitation and poverty. Rodents are the most important reservoirs, and they can acquire the infection early in life and shed the organism into the environment um, throughout their life. Cattle, swine, dogs, horses, and sheep can also be infected as part of the cycle and uh, the organisms may remain viable in the environment for days to months. This is the life cycle of leptospirosis, and you can see uh, the interchange between rodent carriers and other mammalian reservoirs 
where the organism is excreted through the urine into the environment where it can uh, incidentally affect humans. So most exposure occurs as a result of environmental uh, uh, activity. And uh, the organism can enter through mucous membranes, conjunctiva, or broken skin. If you're a, a white water rafter, such as these individuals, it's easy to understand how uh, splashing or misting of contaminated water can encounter the eyes or mucous membranes and lead to exposure. Other rare causes of acquisition include the ingestion of contaminated food and some uh, incidental laboratory exposures. So among the common means of encountering the organism, you want to think about uh, risk factors like adventure sports, certain occupations that are exposed to uh, water, sources of water, and incidental exposures do occur, but they're less common. So think about uh, triathletes, kayakers, military personnel, farmers and ranchers who may have uh, hosts, uh, cow, cattle or other livestock that can be exposed to leptospirosis, returning travelers, laboratory workers, and in uh, endemic areas, residents of impoverished urban areas who have poor sanitation. So leptospira are highly motile aerobic spirochetes. Um, they are best visualized by dark field microscopy, although uh, certain stains like silver or fluorescent stains can aid with visualization. And they kind of look like a question mark as shown here in the photo. And they have a complex classification system that's based on clades, subclades, and serology. Isolation from culture of blood, urine, and CSF is occasionally possible, and, but requires specialized media, such as uh, Fletcher's media, EMJH, or polysorbate 80. This is uh, EMJH shown in the photo. You want to make sure you notify your lab if you suspect it, since uh, it, it, laboratory exposure is a risk. And some molecular methods have been developed, but, but are not widely available. There's a two-phase uh, man clinical manifestation of leptospirosis, the so-called uh, uh, biphasic uh, uh, manifestations. There's an acute febrile bacteremic phase, which can be associated with fever and headache, conjunctival suffusion, cough, diarrhea, muscle pain, and so forth. This is where the patient, as the name suggests, is most likely bacteremic. And this is followed by an immune-mediated phase where other manifestations, uh, mainly associated with the immune response, can be seen. Things like meningitis, pulmonary hemorrhage, myocarditis, kidney failure, and so forth. Similar to rickettsial infections, fever, myalgias, rigors, and headache are the most common presenting symptoms. Conjunctival suffusion is very characteristic of leptospirosis, and the presence of this finding should significantly increase your suspicion. The incubation period it averages about 10 days, but can range between 2 and 26 days. Other clinical manifestations are shown here and can include GI symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms, myalgias, splenomegaly, arthralgias, bone pain, pharyngitis, and aseptic meningitis is under-recognized. Weill's disease is uh, leptospirosis when it is complicated by jaundice and renal failure. And Severe pulmonary disease can also occur. Multi-organ failure can be characterized by non-oliguric renal failure and reversible liver failure. And uh, digital necrosis can occur in severe cases associated with vasculitis and the inflammatory cascade. And myocarditis and rhabdomyolysis is also, poss is also possible. And this is a patient with uh, conjunctival suffusion and subconjunctival hemorrhages that are very characteristic of leptospirosis. Diagnostic findings uh, are shown here. And uh, pancytopenia is common 
leukocytosis rarely occurs. Hyponatremia can occur in severe cases due to the effects of the leptospira organism on the thick ascending limb of Henle, uh, inhibiting sodium, potassium, and chloride co-transport. Transaminitis uh, can be manifested by jaundice. The urinalysis can show proteinuria and casts. CSF in aseptic meningitis can show lymphocytic pleocytosis and elevated protein. The differential diagnosis of leptospirosis includes uh, uh, syndromes like malaria, which, you know, again, is a common cause of, of uh, fever in the returning traveler. Our other arthropod-borne infections like dengue and chikungunya, rickettsial disease like scrub and urine typhus and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, salmonellosis, ehrlichiosis, influenza, and hantavirus. If you strongly suspect the diagnosis, um, you want to follow up with further testing. Although culture from the blood is possible during the bacteremic phase and also via CSF, leptospira PCR of blood probably is the best initial diagnostic study as it offers high sensitivity and specificity, and uh, especially during the bacteremic phase. Commercial serology, especially IgM, is uh, oftentimes negative early on. And uh, if you want to obtain further diagnostic uh, testing and identification, then MAT testing offered by the CDC is strongly recommended and can give you the antibody, the antibody titer and the serovar. Management is really variable and depends upon uh, the, the clinical manifestations in the patient. If you have somebody with mild or asymptomatic disease, an oral course of antibiotics and minimal supportive care may be necessary. And this can range from uh, minor, the minor need for treatment all the way up to severe septic shock with multi-system organ failure. Supportive care in those cases is uh, paramount and can include dialysis, treatment of respiratory and circulatory failure, the use of blood products, and so forth. In mild disease, uh, oral doxycycline or ampicillin or amoxicycline may be all that's needed. Azithromycin um, is another option. In moderate to severe disease, uh, parenteral therapy with ceftriaxone or IV doxycycline is recommended. And in particularly severe disease, many clinicians will combine ceftriaxone and doxycycline. And oral prophylaxis with doxycycline is available. Although there are some human vaccines available, they are not widely utilized. So the main uh, preventative technique is avoiding sources of infection. Animal vaccination can reduce the overall burden of leptospirosis in an environmental setting. And prophylaxis with doxy would be for those among the highest risk. Let's say if there was a laboratory exposure or you were doing something occupational in an area with high endemicity of leptospirosis. So that's my talk about leptospira. And I think this is an important syndrome for us to all be aware of because it is so frequently underdiagnosed. We're gonna move on to talk about a new clinical syndrome, another uh, spirochetosis, and we'll start out with our second case. This patient uh, was a 37-year-old male, and this is from a, a case in the literature. It's not a patient I personally managed, as was the last case. But this, pa this uh, gentleman was seen in the ED in central Utah in the spring. He reported the onset of uh, recurrent fevers, headaches, myalgias, and chills. Three weeks earlier, he had traveled to Jordan and visited archaeological sites. While there, he developed a fever and sought medical care and was treated with a three-day course of azithromycin. Patient denied any outdoor exposures, recent animal or insect bites since returning from his trip. 
Because of the potential for several different exposures, Lyme disease serology was included in the initial diagnostic studies. And the ELISA was actually positive, but the Western blot IgM and IgG were both negative. And thick and thin smears for malaria were collected and were initially reported as negative for parasites. But later on, providers were contacted and informed that spirochetes were seen in the peripheral blood smear. This finding was strongly suspicious for relapsing fever and uh, treatment was started. And the organism through uh, molecular analysis was ultimately identified as Borrelia persica, which is a endemic species to Jordan and the Middle East. And the patient was treated with oral doxycycline for seven days and was lost to follow up, but was presumed to have had a full recovery. And the exposure risk factor was thought to be uh, exposure to ticks in Jordan. So let's talk a little more about relapsing fever. Um, this is uh, one of the two uh, subcategories in the Borreliaceae family, including Borrelia, which causes relapsing fever, avian spirochetosis, and brovine borreliosis. And the second category, uh, Borreliella, which includes the agents of Lyme disease, formally identified as Borrelia burgdorferi sensulato complex. So relapsing fever is an arthropod-borne infection associated with two major manifestations, louse-borne and tick-borne disease. Louse-borne disease is known as epidemic relapsing fever, and it is a non-zoonotic infection associated with the human body louse. Endemic relapsing fever, or tick-borne disease, is associated with soft ticks in the genus Ornithoteros. So you have endemic relapsing fever, or tick-borne disease, which is a zoonotic infection. And in the U.S., two species, Borrelia hermsii and Borrelia turricate, cause most infections. Ornithoteros species ticks also vary uh, by species based upon their, uh, their uh, specific uh, species of Borrelia. Louse-borne disease is a non-zoonotic infection, and it is associated with areas of uh, great uh, unrest, war, or famine in the developing world, and it is only caused by one species of Borrelia, Borrelia recurrentis, and the vector is ridiculous humanus, the human body louse. So uh, this is a tick-borne disease, and you can see there's a specific Borrelia species, an arthropod vector, uh, based upon the geographical distribution. And uh, Ornithoteros is quite small. Um, this is a, a non-engorged uh, Ornithoteros tick on the uh, fingertip of an individual. And uh, there can be quite a change when the uh, soft tick takes a blood meal with a lot of swelling, but this is the uh, non-engorged version of the tick. And this is a map of tick-borne disease by uh, geographic region uh, designating the causative Borrelia species. And you can see it's quite diverse. The human body louse, Pediculus humanus, is one of three different types of, uh, of, of lice that uh, affect humans. And morphologically, it is much more consistent with the head louse than the crab louse but differs from the head louse based upon the size of its abdomen, its front claws, and the morphology of its antenna. Now, the human body louse uh, can cause multiple infectious diseases, including epidemic typhus, trench fever, as well as louse-borne relapsing fever. And it's usually treated by dry cleaning clothing, improving hygiene, and increasing uh, the uh, I should say, uh, reducing the crowding of, uh, of populations in crowded living conditions. This is a brief summary of uh, the characteristics of tick-borne disease compared to louse-borne disease. And you can see there are great differences in terms of the number of episodes, the duration of, of fever, 
uh, the courses of treatment and complications as, and also the uh, case fatality ratio is, is uh, somewhat different. So what are the clinical manifestations of relapsing fever? Well, to quote the Latin, est in nomine, it's in the name. This is a fever that relapses, right? And the incubation period averages from three to 12 days, and it's marked by the onset of fever, and then usually this abrupt resolution that's known as a crisis phase. And the fever intervals uh, can last four to 14 days. Um, then the difference between tick-borne disease is tick-borne disease, there are multiple febrile periods, but in louse-borne disease, there's usually a first episode followed by an abrupt defervescence, an asymptomatic period, and then a usually only a second milder episode before things resolve completely. Other clinical manifestations are quite diverse. You can have generalized symptoms like headaches and myalgias, neurologic symptoms, especially when you have CNS involvement, aseptic meningitis can occur. Cardiopulmonary manifestations can range from myocarditis to ARDS. Hematologic uh, manifestations include thrombocytopenia, anemia, bleeding disorders, can have uh, multi-organ failure, hepatitis, um, and relapsing fever can be particularly um, severe in uh, immunocompromised hosts like pregnant women, where there can be spontaneous abortion and also uh, transplacental transmission. When do you want to suspect tick-borne or louse-borne disease? Obviously, if you have somebody with recurrent fever, especially associated with a crisis phenomenon where there's abrupt defervescence, then you want to think about this. And also in individuals who have risk factors for exposure to these soft shell ticks or body lice in, in areas where the disease is endemic. And you can see the difference between uh, a non-engorged and engorged tick after feeding can be quite significant. The best means of diagnosis is by direct visualization on thick and thin blood smears. It's best to obtain these smears in between the onset and the peak of the febrile episodes. You can also obtain tissue stains. PCR is not widely available and cultures of the spirochete are possible using BSK media, for example, a rare um, mechanism of animal transport of uh, organism transport is animal inoculation. Um, serology is less helpful. So this is an overview of uh, diagnostic methods, and you can see that PCR is usually restricted to research institutions. Culture is also restricted to research institutions. Animal inoculation is more of a historical research method. Serology is uh, not widely available. Really, microscopy is the gold standard. Among the differential diagnosis includes these syndromes shown here, and I've placed an asterisk next to the ones that are also associated with ticks, so you can include that in your differential. But clearly, you want to think about things like malaria, other arthropod-borne diseases, um, other uh, vector-borne diseases spread by ticks, and uh, um, leptospirosis and relapsing fever tend to cause similar uh, symptoms and uh, each is uh, in each other's differential. Tick-borne disease can be more severe than louse-borne disease, but is more sporadic. IV therapy is preferred initially in management. Um, Borrelia uh, and leptospira are being spirochetes or are both susceptible to beta-lactam drugs. Tetracyclines and, uh, and macrolides are alternatives. Treatment duration for tick-borne disease can be up to 10 days, but louse-borne disease is usually treated with a single-dose therapy. This is hard to read, but it is from up-to-date, but shows you the preferred regimens for tick-borne disease, usually uh, Treatment is from 10 to 14 days, 
longer course therapy in patients with CNS manifestations or with uh, neurologic manifestations. Single doses of uh, these agents outlined in yellow are usually recommended for Lausporn disease. If parenteral therapy is needed, uh, IV penicillin G, for example, is an option, as is uh, uh, other IV uh, versions of drugs like doxycycline or the tetracycline agents. If untreated, mortality rates can be very high, especially in tick-borne disease, but with proper treatment, they are quite small, and usually people do not succumb to this infection. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis is available, but the main means of prevention is avoidance of the vectors, as development of a vaccine is unlikely. So both leptospirosis and relapsing fever are spirochetal infections that have many similarities, but some distinct differences. Recall leptospirosis as being a widespread zoonotic infection where the human host is incidentally exposed. There's a biphasic illness uh, manif uh, manifesting of mild to potentially lethal systemic symptoms. Wiles disease is a more complicated version of leptospirosis with jaundice and relapsing fever. Diagnosis of leptospirosis is most readily accomplished with PCR, but a serology is necessary for, um, for, for more specific diagnosis. And treatment is with antibacterials for up to seven days. Relapsing fever caused by Borrelia, and the vector is a soft shell tick or the human body louse. Fever is associated with a crisis that recurs over and over again in tick-borne disease and at least one more time in louse-borne disease. Diagnosis is with uh, blood smears and PCR, and you treat tick-borne disease with antibacterials for 7 to 14 days, and louse-borne disease single-dose therapy is possible. And these are my references, and it's been a great pleasure to speak with you all today, and I thank you all for listening, and I look forward to presenting again in the future. Everybody have a great rest of your day.